Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to Growers Daily, your daily dose of ecological farming insight. It is Thursday, January 9th, 2025. And today we're going to talk about integrating solar panels on farms, catching up on some news items, and we catch up on my own farm, which isn't so much of a news item, but we'll talk about what I'm up to in January. So let's do it. All right. Well, hello, Thursday. I got to say, I've been reading the news about L.A. and the fires out there, and that just has to be terrifying. My heart goes out to all the people going through that, uh, all of my gardening buddies around there, but also all the farmers who will be affected by the many restaurants that have been destroyed. I'm sure that by the time you see this, even more famous landmarks in L.A. will be devoured uh, by the fire there. It's just unreal. I hope you all stay safe. And again, no easy way to transition out of people losing their homes and businesses. Uh, But these fires got me thinking about a couple of recent news items that uh, call back to a few things we've already talked about on the show. Uh, So I thought I would visit those and see where we're at on them. First, which apologies, the show is starting kind of heavy here, but First is where we are on bird flu, which I discussed a couple months back, Uh, and the reason I'm bringing it back up now is, well, sadly, we had our first bird flu death in Louisiana, uh, which was reported on Monday. According to officials, this person was older than 65 and had an underlying medical condition. They became infected with H5N1 bird flu uh, after exposure to a backyard flock and wild birds. However, bird flu remains, according to the CDC, is a low risk to humans still. The reason for that is, although yes, it's everywhere and it's mutating in dangerous ways and is obviously taking a life here, uh, Uh, There has not been any known person-to-person transmission, hence the low risk. So uh, gardeners and farmers, what can we do uh, to help keep it that way? Well, the CDC has a whole list of recommendations, such as avoid direct contact with wild birds and observe them only from a distance, avoid contact with wild or domestic birds that appear ill or have died and call to report sick or dead birds, avoid unprotected exposure to infected live or dead animals or surfaces contaminated by them, Uh, Avoid unprotected direct physical contact or close exposure with cattle and materials potentially infected or confirmed to be infected. And the CDC says people should not eat or drink raw milk or products made with raw milk. Don't shoot the messenger there. That one, um, they are just finding live bird flu virus and raw milk. So anyway, I'm not a scientist or epidemiologist or anything, but I might also recommend uh, washing hands after harvesting eggs and visiting the chickens. Not sure why that's not on their on their list, but Maybe they have a good reason. I just think it's not the worst idea. Anyway, uh, I know this is not going to be the most popular topic I discuss, but because this is a farm podcast and bird flu is largely a disease breaking out on farms and backyard settings, uh, that honestly could affect a lot of immunocompromised and older folks, um, but also potentially children. The Canadian who almost died, who was temporarily put on life support, was a teenager. So I think it's not the worst idea to do our part in this and keeping this thing from taking off. So, uh, okay. So the second news item worth touching on that serves as a follow-up to a previous episode and is at least vaguely lighter topic, uh, is that last Friday, the surgeon general called for cancer warnings on alcohol labels. Now labels are not necessarily effective on their own and getting people to stop doing whatever it is. The warning, the label is warning them about. However, they still perhaps do contribute. Uh, The rates of smokers in the U.S. in the 1950s, for instance, was nearly 50% of Americans. One in two people smoked. Uh, The warning labels were introduced on cigarette packs in the mid-60s. Now, 60 years later, only some 12% of Americans still smoke, so that's a long timeline. But as the instances of cancer rose, along with the warning labels and uh, anti-smoking campaigns, the usage decreased by nearly 40%. Not so much the direct product of a warning label, but the combination of real life experiences, public warnings and information, etc., all led to a massive decline in smoking. But anyway, what that means for the fate of alcohol is hard to say. It may not be exactly the same thing, but again, alcoholic beverages are an enormous agricultural product. So it's just something I want our friends in the booze growing business to be conscious of and preparing for. Uh, Again, shifts in the market have always happened and will always happen. So it's just important that growers stay prepared for the most likely to affect their industry. 
Because as I detailed in one of my first episodes, the research ain't looking great for drinking and cancer, among other causes of death. Uh, to be clear, I quit drinking, but I don't delight in reporting on these things. I still think wine is awesome and beers can be amazing. I just can't drink them anymore. Uh, it's annoying, but I don't care if you drink. Just, you know, that if you're going to start a business around alcohol, that you know what you're up against going forward. But maybe not for another 60 years, like it was with smoking. Who knows? Luckily, I myself uh, planted a few perry and cider trees a few years ago. So if anyone wants some weird acidic pears here in a few years, uh, I may have the hookup. Anyway, I'm going to take a quick break and then get to a question from our Patreon page on farming under solar panels. Literal ones, not like trees. Yeah. BRB. Today's episode of Growers Daily is brought to you by Harnois Greenhouses. Arnois Greenhouses has pioneered controlled environment agriculture since 1965, partnering with market gardeners and farmers across North America to deliver turnkey greenhouse solutions. Their unwavering mission is to support growers' success through innovation and expertise in design, manufacturing, and installation. Arnois Greenhouses are engineered to withstand high wind and snow loads, providing optimal brightness, increased yields, rapid ROI, and long-lasting durability. With over 20,000 projects completed, they are more than a manufacturer. They are a trusted partner. Their structures foster sustainable, energy-efficient ecosystems that drive profitable, resilient agriculture. In 2025, Arnois is introducing a new low-tech, high-tunnel model starting at just $2 per square foot, offering open field growers an accessible entry into controlled environment agriculture. Arnois Greenhouses, leading the way in turnkey solutions for local growers. Learn more at arnois.com. That's H-A-R-N-O-I-S.com. All right, back to the show. If you, the listener, are enjoying this content, getting even a small amount of value from it, consider supporting our work over at patreon.com slash no-till growers. Does this show bring you $5 worth of value each month? $2? Uh, that's how you can guarantee it keeps going. And there are ways to just pay one time so you don't have to you know, have another monthly subscription thing as well. Anyway, I will try to get to questions from everywhere questions come in, but I will always get to those Patreon questions. Today's Patreon question is a good one. It comes from Patreon member Casista DVM, who asks, quote, I want to hear about how to incorporate photovoltaics into agriculture, both animal and botanical, without losing much agricultural ability, end quote. Okay, so a uh, fun question, Casista, who I think I originally called Casita, so apologies there for being terrible at reading. And they had a separate second question that I will address another time because this is one of uh, this one is worthy of its own space here. Okay, so if you, the listener, are like photo of a what now? Photovoltaics are just refers to things like freestanding solar panels. Photo meaning from the sun, voltaics obviously meaning inspired by the antics of 18th century French writer Voltaire, or electricity, or both. Anyway, so the question is basically, can solar panels be incorporated into farms without harming production? And there are a lot of people working on this question, and the practice even has its own term, agrovoltaics, also sometimes referred to as agrosolar, dual-use solar, or for livestock solar grazing. Now, the potential here is huge, but there are a lot of factors that are going to determine efficacy, such as how far apart to put the panels, uh, at what height, what region, etc. But here are some interesting tidbits that I found in the small but growing amount of research um, we have so far. So I don't know that I can give you exact like what to do here, Casista, but here are some interesting tidbits that I found in the small but growing amount of research we have so far on uh agrovoltaics. So one benefit to the crops is first, the panels provide like 10 types of protection, protection from wind, heavy rain, hail, intense sunlight, extreme cold and extreme heat. Uh, the solar panels can also diffuse sunlight, which you know, I'm a big fan of because it helps bounce light to more parts of the plant, thus potentially increasing photosynthesis. The panels can help retain moisture, uh, like reduce evaporation as well uh, by by limiting the sun's exposure. Now it's actually a two-way street here as well for in the case of livestock, you have animals who can graze the grasses and prevent the need to mow as much and preventing plants from blocking the sunlight. Though to be sure, animals are not great mowers and will not always graze well enough to prevent that issue 100% unless you are continuously grazing them in an unhealthy way, which I don't recommend. 
Anyway, I'm digressing. Also, and perhaps more interestingly, the vegetation actually cools the panels and makes them more productive. One study from Oregon State University suggested they are more productive by as much as 10%. So in theory, you could make solar panels and agricultural land both more productive by combining the two. That's kind of amazing, but it's also not necessarily inevitable. Not every plant makes sense under solar panels at every point in the year, especially not in every climate. I know that I would welcome some amount of shade in the summer for practically everything we grow here in Kentucky, save for maybe corn. But in the spring and fall, I need all the sunlight I can get pretty much. Uh, so having a plot or two with panels and other plots without panels would probably be the only way I could swing it, though I suppose... If the return from energy is great enough, perhaps pushing the fall and spring season hard would not be as quite uh, would not be quite as important financially. Now, to bring us back into reality for a second, these systems are wildly expensive to install unless you secure some government assistance. The cost analyses I could find are kind of all over the place, uh, but none of them are particularly cheap. One German analysis found, especially because of the extra details these panels need beyond just regular ground mounting solar panels. Um, you know, they have to be able to bend up and down and they have to be extra tall and sometimes they need extra or different wiring and etc. Anyway, the investment cost for them was around 486,000 euros per hectare, which, which would be roughly $182,000 per acre U.S., now, some studies have also pinned them closer to 100,000 per acre, uh, but probably for less fancy ones because the Germans are hardcore like that and they probably are pretty amazing solar setups. But anyway, that is for more independent construction. Of course, if you're leasing the land to someone, they pay the upfront cost and you don't have to do that. And then they pay you a much smaller fee in return. Uh, in terms of revenue, there are a lot of factors there, but it could be uh, according to some estimates, as much as twenty to forty thousand dollars per year, which means in theory it could pay itself back relatively quickly, like over the course of I don't know five to ten years or something. But again, that's in theory. Uh, these things are complicated and contextual. Of course, there are also environmental concerns and risks, especially the local ecology. It could take a while to rebound the soil after installation, and and so on. This is not a simple idea and will require a lot of research on your end. In terms of seeing this idea in actual practice right now, some examples are, for instance, Jack's Solar Garden out in Colorado. That's probably the most well-known, and there's a lot of research going on there. Uh, there's a working raspberry farm in the Netherlands and an aquaculture farm in China, both under solar panels. There are several case studies uh, available online to read as well from all over the place. Numerous organizations abound doing research and some even offering grants. Inspire is one. Uh, and again, I will put some links in the show notes for you to be able to find those. This is still a relatively new idea, at least in practice. Um, and some crops will suffer under significant shade as basically any urban backyard grower can probably attest to. But with better designs, more research and right crop selection, there is certainly some potential here. It's a topic I'm happy to keep exploring if you all are interested in it. So uh, let me know. And also let me know what thoughts you or experiences you have uh, with this idea. Has anybody put solar panels in their garden? I'd be curious to know. All right, it's break time. And after that, we will talk about what I'm up to here in January. Beyond the ice. Be right back. Today's episode of Growers Daily is brought to you by Peaceful Heritage Nursery. If you're looking for hardy and resilient fruit trees, berry plants, or pawpaw trees, then check out Peaceful Heritage Nursery. Peaceful Heritage Nursery LLC is a mail order nursery shipping premium quality fruit trees and berry plants across the USA. They specialize in resilient, non GMO plant genetics for small growers. Their diverse selection includes berries, cold hardy figs, passion fruit, Gumi, Mulberry, and much more. They're famous for their diverse selection of premium quality grafted pawpaw trees. Five-star Google ratings and customer testimonials attest to their commitment to excellence in quality and service. Find them at PeacefulHeritage.com and join their mailing list. Once again, find them at PeacefulHeritage.com. Use the promo code NOTILL, all caps, one word, for 10% off your first order. All right, back to the show. Okay, so how about some farm and garden updates from us here in early January? Uh, coming up this week, we are looking at single digit and even sub-zero temperatures, which for those of you in Celsius land is like beard freezes uh, to ice cold. That's, that's the temperature. And I can do a small amount of work in these temperatures, uh, prepping the tunnel for my first spring plantings, but it's mostly indoor work like sorting seeds and getting my planting schedule together and doing a lot of reading 
Some of it is related to farming. Also, the ground is still a solid sheet of ice from this week's ice storm and will remain that way for the foreseeable future. I, like for real, like we are expecting more snow on Friday. Uh, some calling for more, 10 or more inches, but who knows? Then again, they're calling for more snow on Monday. I've never actually seen Kentucky with anything akin to snowpack for any amount of time, uh, but that ice storm could lead to a really white winter for us for a while. Not sure how to feel about that. Not sure how it will affect uh, the spring. But luckily, we decided to not go hard at the winter or the early spring, so the pressure is off there. However, I always start to get the itch right around now to get going, even in years where I know I can take it easier. So don't expect me to really hold off very well. We'll see. Garden restraint is not my strong suit. Uh, I wish it were, though. That, that would be helpful. There's so much power and productivity and patience and restraint. Uh, I've gotten better about it over the years, but I can't tell you how many times I put stuff out way too early to quote unquote risk it only to straight up lose it to a cold snap. I certainly don't do that as much as I used to. I've learned that earlier planting is not better than just potting stuff up in the greenhouse and keeping it growing there, waiting for the conditions to get right, uh, or just holding off another week to start something. Sometimes I've found that a certain panic sets in when you feel like, oh, well, I have to sow this or plant that because who knows what the next opportunity will, I will get will be. Uh, when in reality, there's almost always something better I could be doing with my time. One thing about this season for me is that it will be significantly lower pressure than years past. We're going down to just a couple simple, easy outlets, retail and restaurant, uh, with a smattering of other things. So that takes a lot of pressure off the garden. We're also hoping that by freeing up some of that capacity, we can find new ways to help and be a part of our community. That's really important to us. And we're like really debating how to be better about that. But it's not always clear what that looks like. So anyway, once we get to vaguely manageable temperatures where the soil is not frozen, even in the tunnels as it is right now, uh, I'll be sowing our first round of carrots and starting our onions. I can't wait, even though I, I have to. All right. Well, uh, sending my love to our friends and family and farmers and gardeners and everyone in L.A. And I'm going to wrap up this Thursday and start looking at Feedback Friday ideas for tomorrow. Huge shouts to Willie Breeding for the theme music and the team at No-Till Growers. Pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook or the Seed Farmer by Dan Breezebois over at NoTillGrowers.com to support our work. Big, big thank you to everyone over at Patreon.com slash No-Till Growers, where at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, or you sign up in the month of January, you get a shout out on the show so big shout outs today to michelle d oh michelle's our only one uh this story um this is a story about the mentor of april o'neill um and you get the uh you know you get the sense of how she prepared she helped prepare april for one day meeting and befriending the ninja turtles you kind of you kind of have to be i imagine in a very specific headspace for that experience to just take it in stride like she did yep anyway hopefully more people sign up tonight for a story tomorrow we'll see otherwise i appreciate all your support all the time thanks for watching and or listening we will see you tomorrow for feedback friday all right 